Have you taken the survey yet? Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. And I just want to welcome all of my new subscribers. Thank you so much. And, and thank you everybody for joining me on this video today. I'm Mike, I will be your host. And this video is designed to clarify some things and explain some things about what's been going on uh, because I've been getting some questions and I thought I should probably address them all as a whole because as a teacher, I always know if one person asks a question, there's a bunch of people who are afraid to ask who have the same one. And of course the uh, timestamp, I think it's over here, uh, a reminder will be up. And the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to remind you to uh, if you haven't, to go and take the survey. Survey link is down in the description below. And I'll put a little thing here that kind of shows what the survey looks like here or here. I want to give you some influence over the channel's direction uh, going forward from here. So I hope you'll take the time to fill out that survey. I don't have a lot of responses yet. However, I'm finding them really, really interesting. Uh, so I hope I can get a few more of you to chime in uh, just so I can get a better sampling of my viewers. And I've also noticed on the survey that there were some people who weren't sure about my monthly columns or how to find them. And so I want to do a quick walkthrough of my Patreon page so that you can find the monthly columns more easily because I wrote them for you. So uh, let's take a look at my Patreon page right now. So based on some of the survey results I've been seeing coming in, I've noticed that some people aren't sure what my monthly columns are or how to find them. So I wanted to come here real quick and just give you a detailed guide of where they are and how they work. This is my drop page when you come to Patreon uh, forward slash Terranscapes. It brings you here. Here is where my current levels are and down here are my goals. This is not monthly column, but it's related to the channel. So uh, bear with me for a second. Here are the goals that I have set up and they are all related to the channel. So these are things that you want me to add to the channel. And that is how the survey is helping to drive uh, my channel is your survey answers will fill in these slots. I will be revising these based on those survey responses. And the first one I wanted to bring back to the channel are the rapid fire critiques. I love doing them. I know that a lot of people enjoyed them. So I set that goal level pretty low. So if you're interested in rapid fire critiques, your support can make those happen. That's not really why we're here, <laughs> but I wanted to mention it because it is related to the survey. When you go to this tag right here, there's my front page, this will take you to the monthly column list. Now this list is chronological from the most recent down to the oldest. I am going to try to put together a table of contents post that will be closer to the top that will help you find some of those monthly columns. Because right now, you have to scroll down quite a bit to find the older ones. Keep scrolling and anything from the Rust column on down, these are all publicly accessible. I also just noticed today that a lot of the images are broken in uh, some of the columns. I think that's because of the way I changed my Squarespace site when I was organizing it. So I'm going to be spending the rest of tonight trying to fix all of these, but hopefully by the time you get here, they'll all be fixed. Uh, so the Rust columns give you a very good idea about how my newest columns are being formatted. Uh, I've been going into things more detailed, and so I've been uh, breaking them up into multiple parts as a series so that that way I can go into them in depth the way I'd like to, which is, you know, in this instance, looking at how modelers are doing it, of creating Rust. Here's some natural examples of Rust. And then um, this is sort of like, well, how are people technically doing them with techniques? I apologize for referencing my vertigree column in some of the at the bench videos without kind of explaining that. So this is where some of my background knowledge is coming from. And I'm going to include some of the photos from these posts in my at the bench work so that you can at least get a sense of some of the references that I'm talking about and what they look like. And lastly, Lastly, uh, there are posts that I put up that are public 
to give you a sense of what some of my types of content that I put up for my patrons looks like. Hopefully this information helps you to find the monthly columns and uh, I hope you take a look at some of them because I know that I get a lot of questions related to some of these columns and I wanted to make sure uh, that you were able to access them as a resource because I really want them to be a resource for the modeling community. So take a look at those and I hope they help. And some people have been asking me about the Join Me at the Bench videos and what they're about topic-wise or what's their goal, or they don't ask me what the goal is, but they seem to not know exactly what the goal is. So I wanted to address that and uh, also say that after this one goes up, I'm gonna be sitting down and starting to plan the new project. I have more in the Vertigree series that will be coming, but I wanna take a break from them and I wanna start uh, looking at the uh, next coming project. So uh, there will be a little break from the Join Me at the Branch, and then we're gonna talk about what I'll be working on. In the meantime, I realize that I have made an error in that I'm not explaining exactly what it is we're going to be looking at. And I think that's partly because it's kind of new to me and I've been really uh, trying to manage in my head a whole bunch of things. The last one and this one are on my experiment trying to learn how to create a vertigree weathering effect on models. And this is a process where I'm trying to explore the technique, not for any particular project, but just because I feel like I need to get it under my belt. And I'm writing these, uh, I'm writing uh, monthly columns on my Patreon page about this, about vertigree effects. And this was my way of saying at the third stage of my series that I can make suggestions on how to make good vertigree effects. So that's what these videos are about. And what the framework of the content is, is that it is to be not a tutorial. Hopefully there's instructions, you know, instructive material in there for you, but that's not the goal. It is also a place where I can be relaxed in front of the camera and just kind of do some work and have you kind of join me at the bench. That's the point of it. And I'm going to have occasional digressions from the topic based on, you know, whatever occurs to me in my mind. And so I think, you know, I've, I've had some people wonder like, well, you know, you're not, you're not, you're blathering about stuff instead of focusing on this. And it's like, well, I'm not going to just focus on that stuff. That will be the separate videos that are not a join me at the bench. So for instance, one of the things I just mentioned, you'll, you'll see it. I just mentioned it and you'll see it in the future unless you're in the past unless you're in the future in which case you'll be seeing it in the past was a comment about a video game uh, that I had played when I was a kid called Smash TV. It's an example of like, well, that's just what struck me at the moment and and it made me think I should show you what that is. So, I'm going to cut right here and I'm going to show you a little bit about Smash TV and a little bit about video games. I know that's not why you're here, but you're gonna see one anyway. So because I mentioned Smash TV, I wanted to show it to you. Uh, and this is a video game that was made in 1990, I believe, is set in 1999. And it's a TV game show, the most violent in the world. Uh, and you basically clear levels by uh, shooting an assortment of bad guys. Once you complete a level, you will go on and, and go and face against a boss. And at certain intervals, there's the host who comes in, and he comes in with his ladies and gives you encouragement. I don't know if you'd call it that. Big money, big prizes. I love it. Yeah, so that's pretty crazy. And if you look to see what the prizes are, they're all, uh, you know, vacations, and toasters. And this level, I never got to. And so when I was scanning this game, I found that this is one of the highest levels. And of course, it has the best prize you could imagine as a boy. Cleaning up ladies. This is pretty crazy. This is pretty crazy for a regular arcade game, I thought. And then when you're done, you clean up all your prizes and that's, uh, I think, coming on the heels of the 80s, it's very telling about where the culture was at. Cash, cash, cash. But in 82, Robotron came out. So this predates that game by about eight years. And Robotron has a much uh, nobler goal. 
You're saving your family. And this game also had a, a very frenetic pace, uh, much more so, I think, than Smash TV. And this is about the time period when I was really in the throes of uh, playing video games in arcades. Uh, and I remember playing Robotron very fondly. I like how the uh, mom is blonde, the dad has a briefcase. No uh, stereotypical imagery there, but you can see here. The game got busy. But predating Robotron in 1980 was Berserk, and this game was really when I started playing video games. So I'm, I'm 10 when this game came out. And I loved all the robot voices. You know, it, it, it's, uh, and in fact, this is, um, uh, I think, either inspired by or related to uh, Battlestar Galactica, perhaps. And when you won or finished, you could enter your initials by using the joystick and the fire button. So that are the video games of the 80s and early 90s. So hopefully you can see from that that sometimes I'm going to digress, uh, not with video inserts like this. It just was fun and I realized how, I don't know, it was nostalgic for me to think back on how that game was and, and all the other games that kind of led to it. Anyway, that's going to happen in the Join Me at the Benches. So if you're looking for strict content, I'm only talking about what this brush is doing at that moment, then, you know, there might not be right for you. But stick around to the channel because there will be other videos that might fit what you're looking for a little bit better. And I just want to say that I'm still figuring out how to integrate the webcam into these videos. The problem isn't the cam. Well, maybe it is. Um, but it's about me managing my position on the table. And so sometimes... I'm having two problems with the webcam. One is I'm not centered on it. So I'm gonna be putting lines on the table uh, like this, and those will give me a crosshair. They won't be right on the table, you know, they'll be off to the side. I'd like to keep them out of frame, but they will give me a crosshair to make sure that I'm staying center of that frame. And I also have to look into a little bit about the focus issue because unfortunately for this video coming up and the one right after it, which is kind of like part three, uh, the focus is not great from the webcam. And I, I mentioned before that it's it's got a kind of funky thing about the way it focuses. And I, I'm gonna do some test shooting to see if I should just let it run on autofocus. Uh, but I'm also um, planning on uh, putting in a like a height bar right off to the side. So I know that in that crosshair, at that height, that's where the focus should be good. Uh, so at, because I spend all this time and I shot it all, I'm including the webcam footage, but after the after these two, when I go back to shoot some more, I'm gonna do some uh, more prep work on it, see if I can figure out how to get the best use out of it, and then go from there. All right, so uh, just a, a, a little uh, update on what I did. Uh, so, and um, the, the, of course there's photos of the, the miniatures with their accompanying colors uh, that will be in the post, but um, I did the, um, what was this, burn umber and the hull red, and then I did, um, this was uh, scorched brown, and it actually looks a little more red than I realized uh, when I first applied it. And I know it's a red that ha uh, brown that has a lot of red in it, but uh, it looks a little different than I expected. And I didn't really like that, so then what I did is I cut scorched brown with some black, and uh, I think that color looks like a nice foundation for the, the very, very dark colors. Uh, and I did it over here on this model as well. And then I realized I should try the hull red with um, some black. And so I did that as well, and I repainted the front of this miniature. So that is where we stand. Yeah, that, that's easy thinking. Now I'm supposed to figure out what to do with this. You know, it's kind of weird, because I really don't know what I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I can see things on the screen and photos and whatnot, but uh, getting there from here, it's like, well, all right, we'll figure it out. 
All right, so my first thought was applying a little hull red to this color, uh, brush selection becomes its own issue. I did not clean this brush properly when I put it away. I was thinking about uh, a stippling action, but I don't think that's quite right. I think I'd rather apply it almost as a at a at a wash level, so I can you know just subtly. I always got the back of them if I need it. You know, a wash maybe isn't a bad way. Think about it because it doesn't look stippled. You know, when you look at the photos, it's not like it's not like the color gradation is, is speckly. You know, it's sort of just emerging. All right. And since I have two of these guys, I'm gonna go with that for this guy as well. I think the whole red is um, it's too much maybe as a foundation a color. I think it's. It's a good choice for the secondary accents uh, where it really, you know, you're getting into the later stages of the oxidation. And uh, it's a little, I think I'm gonna have to go back, but you know what, I'd like to try it on the hull red. Boy, that came out really dark. See, I think there was a little too much black, but, um, hmm, hmm, he says, hmm. I think the burnt umber is not a great uh, foundation color either. I think it's it's just too brown. Huh, I wonder if I give that a black wash. All right, I'm gonna go with this. I'm gonna go with this guy. Of course, I need to make some kind of record of what I'm doing. I've been trying to use the photos to document what it is that I did so I can see like, oh yeah, I've been putting the bottles um, right next to the mini, uh, the color that I used, so I can go back and uh, and visually look and see, oh yeah. Because the worst thing is to be like, oh, that came out awesome, and then wonder how the hell I did it. Of course, the trick is, this is gonna have so many potential steps. Do I have enough room to write all my notes down? All right, well, we'll see. So this is, I mean, I could use, you know, abbreviations, but you know what? Sometimes I go back and I try to look at it and I say, what does that mean? So that's where we're at so far. Um, here's the odd thing is I actually don't have a black wash, which is ridiculous. Um, in fact, I'm almost out of black paint, which is doubly ridiculous. Uh, you know, like I gotta, I gotta keep some bottles out and I gotta order some paint because, oh my God. Oh, wait. Oh, I do. Okay. Well, I do have some black wash. This is, um, from, uh, I forget. It's like Wonder Works or something. I'd have to look it back up. I've had this for ages. I know that I don't like this wash <laughs> because I think it is, I don't know, it's either glossy or it doesn't flow well or something to that effect. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm out of practice. I should have a little, I should have a little spot on my uh, palette where I wash my brushes off. I keep some, uh, yeah, see, maybe this might take, whoa, I just, apparently I need more wash. You know what I do sometimes? I just put it right on the brush. You know, why waste it on the palette? Yeah, but this wash is not a great wash. And I might actually do like a couple glazes over the mini to bring that color down. You know, I don't think it's a great, I don't think hull red is, I'm going to wash this hull red too. Something just is telling me that color isn't right. It's a little bit too, I think it's a little too bright. You know, the interesting thing though is of course, you know, there's such a huge color variation in, in the shades of reds and browns that I've seen that, you know, really there's, there's, a lot of flexibility, a lot of leeway, I think, with the colors that you go with. Um, and so, uh, 
I probably shouldn't worry too much about trying to get like each one. Like, is this the best? I don't know. And in fact, I'm going to, I have a shield painted hull red and I won't wash that. So we can see a little bit of that comparison. Just want to darken this. So I'll just like, we'll keep painting it until it starts to dry. Kind of a, uh, an interesting opportunity too to see the color shift with a little bit more uh, nice side by side because these are um, burnt umber as well if I believe burnt umber uh, red hull uh, I didn't do a scorched brown and then this is the scorched brown and black and then this is the red hull and black okay apparently I have to write that down Especially because once I start putting stuff on it, the original color may be a challenge to uh, discern. Yeah, actually, I'm not going to be able to continue this, I don't think. Some brush soap on my palette so I can clean my brush properly, regularly. Uh, brush soap. I mentioned this in, oh, of course, in the column on brushes, cleaning them. If you haven't read that column I encourage you to go and do so uh, I encourage you to do so just because it's nice to know that somebody has read them <laughs> uh, but also I think I think it was a valuable column to write because I know it changed the way I clean my brushes now and I feel much better about the way I clean my brushes uh, brush soap it is particularly dried out at the moment I'm going to get some fresh water for that. Not that having paint in your soap is a problem. Reminds me of a joke from uh, Stephen Wright. He was a very deadpan comedian. Was? I think he's still doing stuff. And um, the joke was, uh, can soap get dirty? I guess this is sort of a case in point. All right. Clean your brushes. I mean, I don't clean them, clean them, super clean them in between every color. Oh, but I see, I see paint coming off of that. That didn't show when I was looking at it. Um, but I do try to keep them reasonably clean. Even leave a little soap right on them. Last time I was like, oh God, I gotta do something. And I walked away and I hadn't cleaned my wash brush properly. And I was like, uh, and I came back and I was like, oh, did you ruin it? How much paint did you leave in it? Luckily. Uh, none. Plus it's a big brush, so it stays wet for a long time, so that helps as well. And actually, doing it this way, it strikes me that, uh, you know, you'll overlap some previous areas, so they'll get pick up a little more red. You'll do some areas that you didn't do before, and they'll just start to get a little red, and there'll be areas you haven't touched at all. And so it might get a really nice modeling pattern without all of the uh without you know the stipple look could be wrong when i get done with this process i might be like oh but i feel pretty confident shift that down a little more the other thing that's not good about this wash uh, if i recall correctly is that um it dries with a bit of a glossy finish if you can believe that or not seems kind of not good although i don't know how old this is it may not even be in production anymore i have another wash that I think may be an early GW wash, and I don't know, and so I just labeled the bottle 80s, question mark. Um, it, it goes way before Badab Black and, and any of that. All right, well, 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 I'm looking at it, and I can just, my gut says, it's, these are too monochromatic in the back here. They really need, they need more. More colors. In fact, maybe I need a slightly brighter red. I like the whole red because it has a lot of brown in it. It's sort of the uh, counter to scorched brown. I'm going to take one of these guys in a second. I'm just going to start working on with some of the pigments and just go with that. I really don't like this brown as a base. I know I'm not going to like it. I can just look at it and see it. You know what I have to do is I have to go back and I have to look at the uh, Statue of Liberty color palette <laughs> about um you know the way the statue of liberty changed colors over time as it was created uh because 
you know, there may be, it's, a, it's almost kind of a nice basic palette guide, I think. So it seems to progress from red to a near black. And then from there, enter the um, more greenish hues we are familiar with. So I guess, let's play with something. The first thing I wanted to try is uh, verdigris green. Uh, verdigris, because I think it'll have the most control over, well, I don't know if I agree with that. It's very thin though, so the trick will be to not let it pool into the cracks, overly aggressive. Kind of blew out of the pot. Oh, you know what though? They have a really, you know, they're like alcohol based. And so they start drying up like right away. And uh, I hate that. So I never like to paint out of the pot. They're water soluble. Uh, so that, that helps, but uh, water is not the same as, you know, alcohol, which I think you could also use, uh, but I'd rather, keep the bottle in its original condition and just paint out of a palette. Now here's a potential problem with the model mates is that um, it probably, well, if you're gonna handle the models, it should be sealed because it's water soluble. So if you get your fingers damp and you touch your model, you're gonna wipe it off. And I'm wondering how a clear coat will affect, wow, this is really, Really interesting. I hope you guys are finding it as interesting as I am. That is crazy looking. And uh, crazy in, a, in an interesting way. Alright, so let's get some on there. Play with it a little bit. That is one of the things that makes Model Mates awesome is that you can wet your brush, move it around. Because that's definitely not the look I want. But, wow, did that really, like, when it dries, it, it goes blue, well, blue-green. Oh, weird, though. When you wet it, you're going to lose, yeah, it's interesting. You lose, you know, uh, you lose seeing, <laughs> uh -huh. you uh, can't see the color anymore because it really just flashes that blue right as it dries. So, how am I moving it? But I do think, at least in, in this instance at the moment, I'm looking for something a little more broad coverage, but subtle. You know, so I'm not looking for like strong definition between the areas. I'd like something a little, a little feathery. And see, like here, you know, this this is not good. It's all spider webby. You know, you are going to see it in the cracks. But I'd like to work on trying to manage not having that happen so that I can achieve a, you know, a more controlled look. I guess I would say my main objective is to not have it look like a wash. That's got to be first and foremost. You're not allowed to look like a wash. In fact, I think the look will be improved by making sure it doesn't look like a wash um, because because it doesn't look like a wash on a real object. Yeah, see, I think I got to really kind of wet it to move it a lot. Actually, it has so much body that it really feels like it just fills in details. Now, that's a pretty aggressive, it's a pretty aggressive volume. I don't like that, but I like the possibilities. All right, I think I'll do the back with you guys and then I gotta shut the cameras off for a little bit uh, or I will be editing. Um, eight hours of footage and uh, uh, I actually have some ideas about that um, and how to give you guys a little bit more than what YouTube gets. But exercise, exercise, 
but excise segments of these videos for YouTube and um, have the the raw unedit um, for you guys that then you can just, you know, play in the background while you're painting or whatever. And I'll tell you what I don't like. I don't like that patchiness. So I'm going to add a little alcohol to it in my on my palette. Let's thin it and let's try it on the back side here. Can I just say having rubbing alcohol on hand is one of the greatest liquids you could have on your shelf. A surfactant, a, uh, uh, you know, it's a cleanser. I use it to wipe up stuff. Uh, it dries fast. It's a, you know, I don't know. I use it for all sorts of stuff, cleaning my glasses. Because I think what happens is I think the verdigris is reduced in the cracks and crevices, if you will, um, because that's where the rainwater collects, and I think it washes it away. You know, the uh, verdigris is not very strong. It doesn't adhere the same way that, uh, you know, rust does. Still got that, you know, that pooling effect there. And that strap, I don't, I don't want that to happen. Never thought about that being the challenge, but maybe keeping it out of the crevices is going to be one of the harder, harder parts of this. You know, you can see it happening. It just wants to because, and as I said, you know, um, alcohol is kind of a, a great surfactant. I need a pure alcohol pile. That's what I need. And I think the alcohol uh, breaks it down better than water. So it may be water miscible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best medium to work with. But this is really, really, really interesting though. And you can really see the advantage of model mates because you can really go back in and just muck around with it. I mean, that's not, you know, depending on what you're aiming for and how picky you are, I don't think that's a bad look at all. For this style where it's sort of a generalized effect. Um, I think making sure it's, you know, that there aren't like a ton of spots that are bare is helpful for the overall impression. And I am just running my brush uh, over my uh, paper towel now at this point, and I kind of get some on there and then uh, just run that off so that I'm not flooding it. Oh wow, here's a weird thought, which actually I think I might try next, is to uh, I don't know, I was going to say to wash the whole miniature and then go back in and remove the areas where you don't want. Oh, yeah, so but that's okay. It's really. Oh, Jesus. It's weird trying to do this kind of quickly. It may not look like that, but. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to wrap it up there because the other camera just shut off, and I'm going to come back. A little later and um, we'll see how things are coming along but I think that's I think that's very very promising all right catch you on the flip side and I will just say that editing these has been a little bit tricky partly because of the length of the videos and it makes a rather large rather large project for me to work on a lot of edits to cut out mouth sounds and ums and ahs and and take that hour and it's really more like a half an hour of content which I'm putting up on Patreon and then I'm trimming that down a little bit more for YouTube uh, which is about 20 minutes, 25, something like that. Uh, but it's also tricky style-wise because a very casual hanging out session is gonna have pregnant pauses, the sort of gaps or, or silences while I'm thinking or whatever, but I don't wanna feel it with dead time, but then I feel like it might feel a little crushed if I come in on all the sentences real tight and it also cuts out some of what it is I'm actually doing. So I'm kind of playing with it and trying to get a feel for it. You can give me feedback. You can always put that in the comments. 
uh, that's great. But you can also go to the survey. There's an open response at the bottom of it where you can write in anything you want, anything. So uh, if you want to address the format of a video or, or whatever, that's a place you could do that as well. So I encourage you again, for so many different reasons, uh, to go take the survey and it's only going to take a couple minutes and it would be really valuable uh, for me and for the other viewers on the channel. Viewer comments. Exodus 02 mentions me getting a 3D printer and I have had Many people over the last several years mentioned me getting a 3D printer, whether I'm interested, it's something I thought about. And I have thought about it for a little while. I thought about it really seriously. That's unusual. I have a pen in my hand. Uh, really seriously. And then I realized I just, it's not the, the printer, it's the software and about sculpting through that software. It's a big time investment and I just have so many I don't need to add. I don't need to add anything else to my list of things to learn. So so there will be no 3D printer in my, in my life in the foreseeable future. Carolyn Croft and Everett T ask about the Elvin project and I realized, see I haven't been explaining things very well, that the Elvin project is the one where I was designing all of those buildings in uh, Inkscape uh, and I was going to have them laser cut and assembled. And so when the uh, Elf project was terminated, I decided that I would not pursue those buildings any further. That was a very hard decision on my part uh, because I had invested a lot of time in them. But I know that to take them where I want to go will require a lot more investment in time and I just not sure if that's the direction I should be going or want to go. So uh, if you're concerned about or curious about what happened to those, that's what happened. All those buildings are set aside, the files have been stored, and I'm letting that ride for right now uh, while I try to figure out plenty of other things that I'm trying to work through. And Mutant Goblin uh, had a comment about live streaming and Twitch. There's a question on the survey for that. And he said something to the effect that when people live stream, they don't get a lot done on their project. And because they're working on their project, they don't get a good connection with the viewers and their comments. And it looks like you're being busy, but you're not getting anything done. I found that funny and accurate. And it's something that was a big deterrent for me doing live streams in the past where I felt a little bit more under pressure. It's something I'd like to consider and explore and think about what I can do during those periods and how I can uh, modify my workspace to make my communication with viewers more, more easy. But it's, it is, I think, a challenging format to work under. Uh, but I'd like to I'd like to explore it. So it is something that I will at least be testing. I'll probably do a test with my patrons first just to get a feel, you know, can see it, upload it, get a sense of how that all works and looks. But I know it has challenges. Unfortunately, there is no cocktail of the evening uh, for this video. I was planning on it. I actually thought about it before I started hitting record on the cameras and then I realized, look, I got to get this done because it's Tuesday and I still don't have it up. And uh, Monday was kind of a rough day, a little hungover from New Year's Eve, you know. So uh, I was ready even though I wasn't, I wasn't up to it. So, so no cocktail for tonight. So hopefully that isn't a deterrent for you returning for the next video. And uh, just before I go, if you are able not everybody can, uh, to support this channel and you would like to. Uh, this is an ad-free channel. It's entirely viewer supported. So if you would um, like to contribute to that, there's um, a link for the Patreon page, which I just showed you, uh, and you can make a donation there. And hopefully you will be coming back for the next video because you know that I will be back soon with another Terrence Gapes video.